All right, folks, welcome back to the channel and to another episode of Fresh Finds. I uh, hope you're having a great spring, summer, whenever you're watching this out there and that you're playing a lot of hickory golf and that you're finding some cool clubs and antique stores and flea markets across the country and across the world, wherever you're watching this. Uh, today, I want to share with you some clubs that I picked up on a recent trip my wife and I took to Cape Cod. Uh, we spent a few days up there. I got a chance to play feathery golf at Highland Links in Truro, which was awesome. And on our way back, we stopped at an antique center in Yarmouth where I found a bucket of clubs. It was a literal barrel of clubs that were all in pretty rough shape. Uh, but, you know, my experience seeing clubs now, I was able to notice some things about these clubs that made them worth buying. Uh, most notably, the price. Um, I hesitate to tell you what I paid for them. Uh, because I think that even, you know, these prices were kind of ridiculous for what I usually come across. Uh, but I'll tell you that, um, there are clubs out there that you wouldn't believe, um, and they barely cost you, you know, the price of a value meal at McDonald's. Case in point, this particular Tom Stewart Mashey, this club cost me five bucks. So, yeah, it, it, it's crazy sometimes what you find out there, but it's just a, you know, um, proof that you got to go out there, be persistent, be patient. You'll find these clubs. There were millions of them made during the Hickory era, so they're out there. Um, and uh, they're still able to be found for cheap. But let's talk about this club specifically, because it's a bit of a mystery club. Um, so you know, the things that we can tell about it right away, obviously, it's a Tom Stewart. Um, it's a late era Tom Stewart because it has a line face and it also has the numbering associated with the name club. So Mashies eventually became Sixes as far as Stewart was concerned. And, and this combines both of those uh, to keep people familiar with the old way of, of naming them and the new way of, of describing them. Uh, other than that, we see two marks here on the toe. And these are notable. Um, these are called Foreman's Marks. And um, there were about a dozen foreman marks, uh, all of which are, well, maybe not all of which, but many of which are, you know, described and detailed in this book by Ralph Livingston, which if you're a fan or collector of Tom Stewart golf clubs, you need to find this book. It's out of print um, and kind of pricey when you do find it. This isn't even actually my copy. This is uh, my buddy Jim Pucci's copy. Um, but uh, this is a, a comprehensive book that was basically a catalog of all of the clubs that Ralph Livingston owned of Stewart's and also clubs that he had access to, um, you know, to take photos of so that he could try to come up with a fairly comprehensive example of the clubs that Stewart offered. But even then, I mean, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg of Stewart clubs that are out in circulation uh, at this point. And, um, you know, this club may be one of those, uh, but maybe not. So let's talk about it. Um, I'm going to kind of bookmark that page there because I'm going to refer to that in a second. So uh, let's talk about the foreman marks. Like I said, the foreman marks are detailed, at least the ones that we're aware of, about a dozen or so uh, that Ralph Livingston uh, outlines in the book. But they were basically marks that a foreman would make on a club that was a little bit different than, you know, uh, a standard run forging. Um, a lot of times you're just going to see one mark and uh, we don't know who the marks you know, for the most part, we don't know who the marks referred to. There, you know, specific foremans probably had their own marks, but there is one mark that will show up on clubs on occasion that we do know. It's the dot, and a deeper dot, and sometimes it's not as deep, but it, it's a noticeable, you know, dot mark on the toe of the club. That was actually Tom Stewart's personal inspection mark. So uh, those. You know, the clubs with those marks are usually special orders. Uh, so, a, you know, a specific kind of club that deviated significantly from whatever the original standard design of the club was. Stuart would look at those to make sure that they passed uh, muster before they left the shop. Or he would also put his stamp on clubs that were intended for important or notable players. Um, so we don't know if this was made for a specific player because the oval stamps simply says Tom Stewart Maker St. Andrews. Uh, so it's possible this was made for a notable player. Uh, but what I think his mark in this instance refers to is the deviation from the standard mashy that was made at this time, uh, enough so that Stewart wanted to take a look at it before it left the shop. The other mark that we can see on this club is a 44. And it's kind of a crude stamping here. Um, the font of it, it matches other numbered fonts that Stuart used on his clubs, but it's smaller and it's not as deep and it's kind of in a weird spot and it's a little askew. Uh, it looks like it may have been added after the fact. 
Uh, and Tad Moore mentioned that. I, I, I posted a photo of this club on Instagram, and Tad Moore commented on it and said that he was pretty sure that this was added after the fact uh, because of the stamp. You know, there's no way to know for sure. Uh, the, the speculation or the theory that I put out when I posted this photo was that it was possible that the 44 here referred to the 44 model of Mashie that Stewart made that, uh, you know, we really only know examples of from a very rare set of clubs that was based on templates uh, used for Bobby Jones and Francis Wilmette clubs. And uh, those are the kind of famous and super rare uh, FO or RTJ FO series. And in that, you know, there's a photo of, the, of that club in the book and it very clearly is stamped 44. Um, in fact, I'll show you a picture of the book. I need to refer to it myself here before I keep talking. But it just simply says 44. And there is a foreman mark on that picture, but it's not a Stewart in uh, personal inspection mark. So interesting, um, you know, the 44 from my eye, the font is the same as the one that's on my club, but this one is smaller um, and uh, may not be, this. it's not the same depth of stamping as that one. So uh, to Ted's point, he thinks that it was probably later stamping. And, um, you know, just based on the, the way that it's set in the, in the club, I think he may have a pretty good point there. Um, that all said, uh, we don't have any manufacturer records from Stewart to clearly tell us what the specific marks were for. Or, you know, there's other clubs in, in Ralph's book that have marks that we've never figured out what they meant. Um, so there's a possibility uh, that this club was designed uh, for a special order who, you know, someone said that they wanted the 44 mashy shape, but with a different loft. Because the interesting thing about this club is that it's, uh, let me see what it is, 39 degrees of loft, which puts it in a mashy niblick uh, kind of pitcher range of club. And um, the original 44 clubs were much stronger loft, 25 degrees of loft. So my theory was that someone special ordered the 44 mashy shape, but with a weaker loft so that they could use it as a pitcher. Uh, it does have a fairly thin sole, not as thin as soles I've seen in the past, but um, the interesting thing about the swing weight it's, the, it's a, just about the proper length for a club of 39, 40 degrees, maybe about a quarter inch, half inch short. Uh, but even then, the swing weight on this club is very light. Uh, it's only B7. And if you added a half inch to it, you'd only bring it up to C0 just about. Um, so it's very light. Uh, that's actually consistent with other pitchers that I've come across. Um, for some reason that was kind of a, you know, people wanted a, a lighter club for those specific kind of finesse chips around the green, you know, to pitch or, you know, a little bit further than a chip, you know, in a pitcher's case. But, um, yeah, it, it would be consistent to have a lighter club with a pitcher. Uh, but this is something I wasn't aware of until I posted that and Tad, uh, responded. Um, he said that, you know, a lot of the clubs that you come across from the late era, Hickory era, um, no matter who the company was, uh, specifically, he says, Tom Stewart and George Nickel clubs from the late 20s, early 30s, you know, toward the end of the Hickory era, they're often very light. And uh, I asked him why he thought that might be. And he said that's something that him and the other old timer collectors have been discussing for a long time. No one knows for sure. Um, you know, one theory that I'd throw out there is maybe there was some effort on the part of uh, old school club makers who were still using hickory shafts to make their clubs a little bit closer to the weight of the newer pyrotone and steel shafted clubs that were coming out. I don't know if that's if there's any veracity to that at all. I'd have to, you know, measure the difference between early 30s pyrotones to hickories, but I can tell you that um, if you've ever picked up a hickory shafted club, you know that the overall weight of it is definitely heavier than later, you know, pyrotone and, and certainly modern clubs. So that's my two cents on it, you know, as to why the, the makers may have been making lighter heads at that time. Um, but we'll never know for sure. And there's a lot of speculation out there and, and different theories. So um, you know, there isn't really a, a, a book end to this, this particular club's history. Um, it just a lot of mystery. Um, I will say that Stewart's inspection mark suggests that there was something significant enough about this club that Stewart himself wanted to inspect it before it left the shop. 
uh, we'll just never know exactly what that is. So cool club there for $5. That's a great story to, you know, I, I had a nice afternoon of research and a nice conversation with Tad Moore over a club that uh, I paid five bucks for. So that was very cool. Uh, the other clubs that I want to show you um, are the uh, the ones that were in rougher shape, but still have playable utility, in my opinion. Um, I've already taken the heads off these four. These are the four most notable clubs that are going to turn into players. Um, well, one, three of them are going to turn into players, probably. But uh, one thing I want to mention, I've, I've actually mentioned this before in previous videos, but I think it's worth reiterating. Um, when you come across clubs that are this rusty, a lot of people will pass them by because they think they're past the point of being able to repair them or restore them to a point where you can play them. Uh, it's certainly true that if you do some restorative process to this club, it's still not going to look pristine. Um, and it's probably not going to have the collectible value that someone would want in it if they weren't playing it but it's still got plenty of life left in it as a playable club. Uh, this is a really cool shape Gibson putter uh, that I'm going to give a quick soak in EvapoRust to. Um, I've kind of, I've got a finessed process now with the EvapoRust. I don't just drop them in there and let them sit for an hour or two. Um, what I'll do is I'll let them sit in there for about 20 minutes, and then I'll do a little bit of scrubbing, maybe let them sit in there a little bit more, but, um, you know, there's, there's more nuanced process that I'm using with the evaporust so that I don't let them get past the point of looking authentic, not authentic, but past the point of looking old. Um, I've learned, you know, that if you just let a club sit in there for a long time, it'll make the club look too washed out. And uh, I don't like that. So I'm kind of leaving some of the patina on here. I'm just trying to remove the really, you know, crusted parts of rust. So that's the process that I'm going to use with these. Um, you'll actually see that process, you know, kind of in a time lapse here in a bit. Um, but this is going to be a perfectly playable putter. In fact, you could probably put this back on the shaft and, and play it as is. Uh, but I just think that, you know, the, the stampings are really deep on this one, and I think it's going to come out real nice through the evaporust, um, hopefully. Uh, the only issue we may run into when, when we move, remove the rust is that the pitting is obviously going to still be there. And it'll be interesting to see how that, you know, makes the club look, if it's going to look worse. Sometimes it's almost better to leave it with a nice coating of rust on it because it covers up that pitting um, that makes it a little more unsightly when it's cleaned. Uh, but we'll see. Um, this club costs $8.50, this head. So that's a deal. Uh, we've also got in a similar state of rust, uh, this Gibson Mashie. Uh, I'm thinking this is probably a deep face mashy because it's got a deeper face on it. Um, this will also make a pretty good play club and uh, also has a fair amount of rust in it and the same, like I said, the same situation as the uh, the Gibson putter there. So uh, both of these are going to, I'm going to keep an eye on to try to, you know, do a, a nuanced evapo rust treatment. Um, this is going to be a fun club to put in the evapo rust. I can't tell who the maker of this is. It's got some characteristics of an early smooth face iron, and by early I say probably, you know, turn of the century. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to see. I can barely see some stamping underneath the rust here, and I'm pretty sure that once I let this sit in a rust for a little bit, we're going to be able to read that. So this is a true diamond in the rust, as I like to say, um, where there, there's kind of a fun surprise at the end of the process of removing the rust on this. Um, so we'll see what that one is. And then finally, we've got an interesting Robert Condy club. This one's a little light. Uh, it's 26 degrees. I measured it before I took the head off. Uh, but it's got an interesting bevel here uh, toward the sole. Um, so, yeah, it may be a little light for me to play, but uh, I think once the appropriate shaft is in it, it'll be in the mid-Cs, uh, maybe low Cs, and uh, it'll be a player for somebody, I think. Uh, Condi made great clubs. Whenever you see a Condi stamp club, make sure you pick it up because um, he was just a great forger of irons back in the day. And um, I've come across clubs that are a little light um, from him, but uh, I think this one's going to be cool no matter what. So those are the four that I'm going to work with out of the batch of clubs that I got in uh, uh, Cape Cod. And uh, the other thing that I want to mention that I'll show you in this video real quick is a restoration of these guys. So this was a find, if I can clip this, unclip this here. Yeah. 
This is probably one of the coolest finds I've had in an antique store. I actually found these in an antique mall in uh, Ohio. And not only, well, let's just start with this. So it's very rare that I ever come across head covers that are still attached to the primary device that was used to attach them to the bag. This still has its original clip. It's in great shape. Um, the, uh, the cording here is, is still really strong. Um, you know, the head covers themselves, we got one through four here. And uh, just, I mean, I couldn't believe it when I saw these. These were $6. <laughs> so again, in the theme of finding really cool things for cheap, uh, keep looking because they're out there. But these four head covers, Attached to this, um, really cool uh, uh, contraption here. It's actually patented. Uh, I believe these were made by Spalding, and I'll prove that in a second. Um, but yeah, six bucks for this. So that would be great if there was only one of these there. Uh, I ended up finding two more. Um, I don't have the third one in here, but this was the uh, arguably the coolest one, but unfortunately also the one that was in the worst shape. So the leather on this is, is pretty dried out and cracked. And, um, you know, it, it's probably worth past the point of being able to restore to a, uh, a usable format. But it's a cool decoration. It, these were six bucks as well. Again, still has all the, uh, the contraption. And here's where I say that uh, the ones that I just showed you are made by Spalding. This is the same patented piece here, and it clearly says Spalding here and has the patent number. I looked that patent number up, and it referred to something related to uh, sewing equipment. So I'm not quite sure I was looking in the right place. If somebody who's familiar with patents or looking up patent information wants to help me with that, I'd be happy to give them the number there. Um, might even show up in the video. But um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what the story is with the patent. Uh, but I think it's pretty apparent that they were made by Spalding. This one still has the original clip as well. And uh, these are just going to hang in my, my, my uh, little museum here um, because uh, I'm actually going to use these. Uh, so the third set uh, I'll be selling actually later this summer uh, at the Gulf Heritage Society National Convention. So if you're anywhere near Indianapolis and you want to pick one of these guys up, find my table because I'll have the uh, third set there, which I think is going to be a usable set once I uh, do the process that I'm about to show you with right now. So uh, you may recall from several workshop videos ago that I introduced you to Skidmore's Restoration Cream. Uh, I use that to recondition the wooden shafts um, and I also use it to recondition uh, authentic leather, you know, vintage leather grips, smooth face grips or, or smooth grip. So that's to say that the product works great with both wood and leather. In fact, you can even use it on uh, the metal heads. The, the beeswax in the uh, formula helps work as a rust preventant. But that aside, I used the Skidmores to bring these back to life. And if you could feel this video, <laughs> you'd feel how supple the leather has become now that I've done just a quick treatment with the Skidmores. And I'm going to show you that here in this video in a second as well. These are the ones that I think I'm going to try to do some restorative work to because I think that they're still supple enough and uh, in good shape that I could use these. Um, so what I'm going to be using is this Skidmores Leather Cream. Um, it's in a different kind of packaging, but it's the same stuff as the infinitely useful restoration cream. Uh, when I talked to uh, the folks at Skidmore's, they explained to me that uh, they've, they packaged this in a specific leather cream container uh, so that people know that you can use it for leather because they found that sometimes people don't realize you can use the same stuff for both leather and wood. Um, so that's why it's in a different packaging. But I've got plenty of it. Uh, I don't think I'll need to use that much. I'm only wearing a glove because this stuff is probably going to get all over the place here and, and it's going to be a little dirty. So just to keep my hands cleaner, um, got some other things going on in the workshop that I need to bounce around to. So um, if I try this and it's not really working, I'm just going to take the glove off and use my fingers because this is just beeswax and linseed oil. Um, and I'm just going to use a little bit to start. Put it on my hand here. Um, you know, one of the dangers with doing any kind of conditioning work or you know uh, restorative work to leather is sometimes it'll change the color when you start applying something to it 
Um, I'm not really too concerned about that happening with these. I mean, it may change the color on them, but I want to use them. I've already got a set that's on display, so I don't need to have these just sitting around doing nothing. I want to use them, and in order to make sure that they're going to, you know, be in good shape uh, to use, I want to condition them. So if they lose a little bit of their, you know, uh, color by doing this, I'm, I'm okay with that. But I actually think that this stuff's going to actually make these look a lot better. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is just start rubbing it in. Uh, this stuff's great because it's going to clean and condition at the same time. So, you know, sometimes when you use a leather cleaner, it has a tendency to dry out the leather and you have to make sure you condition it really fast um, so that it doesn't lose more moisture. And uh, so far, actually, that's looking pretty good. It's not really that dirty. Just a little stiff, a little dry. Um, so I'm going to keep my hand in it for now just to start here, make sure I get it into these grooves and in the, the seams. I expect some of these, yep, that's what I was just gonna say. I expect some of these scratches and, and uh, marks here to, to kind of blend into the leather a little bit more as I do this. Um, eventually I'm gonna put a head, a, an old wood head, a brassy head in here to kind of get it into the shape when I get up to this part to, to do that. But for now, I'm just gonna keep my hand in here. So we're just going to go around and the beeswax is going to um, help prevent moisture from getting into it, kind of give it a, a water repellency, though I would not use these on a wet day. Um, and maybe you could, but I just, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't want them to get wet after I do this conditioning work to them. I'll try to keep them in as good a shape as I can at this point. But yeah, just going to go around all the way here. So far, I'm really happy with what I'm seeing. Right, I think at this point, I'm gonna put the wood into the head cover. I wanna be a little careful doing this stage because if you haven't conditioned the leather yet on a, you know, on something, it, it could start to crack more when you, you put some stress on it. But these are actually still in really good shape even before the reconditioning, so I'm not too concerned about that. And I wanna be able to get into these nooks and crannies here. So I'm gonna use I think at this point I'll use the cradle. I'm not sure if it's showing up, but these are calf skin. So that's the kind of leather that uh, Spalding was using for these. Pretty sure they're spalding. And I'm not using too much either um, as I go here. I, I know I keep dipping my finger in, but I'm really just tapping it in there a little bit. Um, it does go a long way when you get it on the leather and start working it in. But also the great thing is, like if you buy one pint uh, for your wood shaft uh, conditioning and, and leather conditioning for your grips and things like that, that's plenty to go a long way. Uh, another one of the projects that I want to show you using the Skidmores is reconditioning the leather on an old canvas bag, um, which again, I think if this is any indication, it's going to, you know, turn out really nice and supple once again. Uh, for use. So, yeah, once I get these, once I get them all finished, I'm going to let them sit for a while and see how they dry. Um, and then I may do another application of it, but right now I don't think I'm going to need to. Okay, so I think that's a good spot to stop on this one. Let's show you comparatively one that hasn't been conditioned yet. You can already see that the one that I worked on has an obvious, you know, sheen to it. Moisture's been reintroduced to the leather. And um, I'm going to leave the head in here now as this starts to dry so that it can get used to being in the shape of a club head once again. 
And um, yeah, I'm just gonna let this sit dry and we'll see how uh, it looks after I after it dries for a couple hours. Um, I mean, I say dry, it doesn't really need to dry at all. It's I haven't wet this or anything, um, but I am interested to see how much uh, this the leather sucks this in, uh, ha not having been reconditioned in, you know, probably 90 years. <laughs> um, I date these to the er mid 30s, mid to late 30s, something like that, uh, based on the patent date or the patent information here. Um, but yeah, interesting note about that. The patent number that's referred to here is actually for a locking mechanism on a sewing machine uh, that dates to 1934. So I'm not entirely sure what the relevance of this patent number is to the actual head covers. Uh, it could be some aspect of this this clip here, you know, that, that everything's attached to. Um, not sure. Uh, so if anybody knows, you know, please let me know. Um, but uh, yeah. That's that. All right, so we are finished with our combination vinegar evapo rust soak. Uh, I actually let these two guys sit in the evapo rust longer than I anticipated because the rust was caked on there pretty good. And uh, I just wanted to try to see if I could find more information on the clubs. You can tell the difference between a soak in vinegar and a soak in evaporust just by the tint. Uh, there's a little bit more yellow here. The vinegar doesn't take off as much rust. The evaporust pretty much pulls all of it off, but it also kind of leaves a more bleached outlook, um, which is why I originally didn't want to let them soak too long. Uh, but I think for the sake of you know information, I uh, ended up soaking these longer. So let's take a look at what we've got. Uh, the one I was most excited about seeing how it would turn out was this uh, Domini Gibson putter. A very cool head, and uh, if you recall earlier in the video, I said basically all I was trying to do is get the caked on rust off of this, but leave the patina, and I'm pretty satisfied with this. Um, you know, like I said, it's got a little bit of a yellow tint to it because of the vinegar, but as I start to play this, this club, or someone else starts to play it, it'll pick up a natural patina um, as it picks up moisture and things like that. And um, I think I set it on its on its way to you know to aging well again, uh, you know respectfully and not getting too rusted up uh, anymore. So I used a quick wipe with a rem oil wipe to kind of keep any flash rust from showing up on it. And uh, yeah, I think that's a really cool club for 850. You can't beat it. Let's take a look at what else we got. This is going to be a cool player. Uh, this is a deep face mashie made by Gibson, and uh, this one turned out pretty well as well. Again, it's got a lot of plenty of age look on it, but um, also has still retained its heft, so it's going to be a nice player. Uh, that does remind me that we weighed the Gibson putter before we put it in the rust. Let's see where it's at now. I believe it was 275, 275 grams. Uh, it might have been, it had to have been 285 grams because now it's 284. So lost a gram of rust, basically. Um, and, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll lose even more than that, depending on the situation of the club. But that's pretty good. So, yeah. Um, I didn't weigh the Gibson Deep Face Mashie, but I can tell just by holding it in my hand that it's, it's good, uh, good weight for a player. These two clubs here that I had in the Evapo Rust. Um, you know, by my definition, wouldn't be the greatest players because they're a little light, but they're still interesting clubs. This is the Condi, um, and I could tell that it was a Condi before I did the rust treatment on it uh, because this was pretty clear still. It's got kind of a beveled edge here leading into the sole, um, which I haven't seen yet on a Condi. Um, I'm sure there are plenty more out there, but I hadn't seen it yet. So it's a cool club for me to have found, um, and I was hoping there would be more information in this area that would reveal itself after the evaporust soak, but uh, no luck. So at the very least, we know we've got a Condi made uh, mid iron. I think this was 26 degrees and uh, with the appropriate shaft, it'll probably play about C3 swing weight. So a little bit lighter, uh, but uh, somebody would might, you know, want to try to play this and I'll have this in my store eventually at hickoryhacker.com. The mystery club. This was what I was hoping would turn into a diamond in the rust. And um, I think what we've got here is an early McGregor Edgemont line club. 
I say early because it's smooth face and I, you know, until I had done the full treatment, I wasn't quite sure if we were going to find any markings on the uh, the face. I was expecting to because the only edge mounts that I've come across have been either dot face or line face. And I understood this to be more of a con an economy line for McGregor that was, you know, late teens, early 20s. But this smooth face suggests that it's earlier than that. I would say probably pre-1915 because they started to phase these smooth faces out. Um, you know, that's a late date for smooth, you know, kind of... Uh, eliminating smooth faces and starting to add either dot faces or line faces uh, to the face. So uh, I got to do a little bit more research into this because uh, this makes me think the edge mount line is earlier than I thought. Unless, all that said, this is a different edge mount and it doesn't have anything to do with McGregor. Um, so yeah, interesting club nonetheless. Uh, it's always fun to put these in a rust treatment and see what comes out. Um, Gavin Bottrell uh, with the uh, Time Warp Golf has done some of these, uh, you know, with his rust removal process, and um, he's found some really cool 1880, 1890 irons that way. So uh, hopefully I'll run into one of those in the future. I've got a couple others here on the side uh, for future, um, you know, videos that we can do this diamond in the rust process with. Uh, but yeah, so pretty fun. You know, like I said, each of these clubs was either five dollars or eight fifty a piece. Uh, in addition to that Stewart that I showed you earlier, so you can't beat that. I had a fun time working with these, and uh, a couple of them are going to turn into players.